when I was pastor of the Cato Tabernacle and on Coast to Coast Radio, that was the biggest thing then religiously in America. And you know what? They started shooting at me as soon as I got there. Never bothered me until I got there. Then they said I was an interdenominationalist. Well, now, they didn't exactly belong to the Ananias Club, but they lived across the street from where it met. No, it wasn't a church at all. We never did have an organized church. It was just a preaching center. It's like a fellow said, well, did you baptize? I yeah. What did you baptize them into? I said the same thing Philip did the eunuch. Amen. A lot of the barnacles that we've gathered up is not too good. Amen. And then when I left there, I thought maybe they quit then, so I left there and went into evangelistic work and moved to, well, I stayed in evangelistic work. Then I came to the biggest thing in, in the world now, not America, but the biggest thing in the world. And that's Thomas Road Baptist Church. And I found them shooting at me here, amen. <laughs> One fellow said that I was a pseudo-fundamentalist. I don't know what that means because I never went to college. I never had any education, and I'm glad. Because if I've been educated, I'd know what that word means, and it'd make me mad, maybe, I thought. <laughs> Don't worry about it, amen. Let me say this from the bottom of my heart, and I've traveled all over this country, all over the United States and Arkansas, and I've traveled all... <laughs> but let me say this to you. I do not believe there is, a, there is a work on the encircling globe in this or other lands that is greater and reaching more people and doing a greater work than this work here. And the evident blessings of God is upon it because he supplies their need from day to day, and I thank God for it. And I thank God for having a little part in it. I want you to know this, when you put your money in this work, you're investing in something that will pay dividends after you've gone to heaven. This man is not this man is not profiting from it personally. And I've said this, you know, a, a, a good a word pitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And he said, With not good from them to whom it is due when it is the power of thine hand to do it. And I believe in giving that's what Jesus said concerning Mary, she hath done a good work on me. She hath come to anoint my body for the grave, and wheresoever this gospel is preached throughout the whole world, this shall be told as a memorial of her. What did she do? She said she brought my flowers this side of the grave. Don't wait till a man dies and then bring a big wreath, because you always put your name on it so the dead will know who brought it. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If I do not believe this man, this man, my friend, I am saying this, and I said it publicly. I say it publicly wherever I go. Dr. Jerry Falwell is one of the most godly men that I've ever known. A great man of prayer. And God blesses him. So I don't worry. Don't worry about him, son. Let him talk. You know what? Mrs. Lincoln and I had only one son. If he were alive, if he would have lived, he would have been. Jerry is just ten years younger than he was. He would have been 55 years old had he lived. God saw fit to take him home. So Mommy Bob and I now look upon Dr. Falwell as our son. We like to think of that. We love him deeply and pray for him. Amen. Pray for him. I believe that it's yet to be seen. I think the 50,000 will be in school someday. Well, I better get to business, I guess, ain't it? <laughs> Little boy, one day the, the teacher was teaching some object lessons, and they opened a nutshell, and out of the nutshell he took a little piece of paper on which was written John 3.16, and he held it up and said to them, What is this? And the little boy piped up and said, Sir, that's the gospel in a nutshell. And that's what it is tonight, John 3.16, if all the Bible was destroyed. From the first word in the book of Genesis to the last word in the book of the Revelation, there would still be enough gospel left in John 3.16 to save the world. It was a long time after I'd been preaching. It was a good many years before I ever attempted to make a sermon from John 3.16. It seemed so high and so wide and so deep. It simply did not lend itself to sermonizing. 
I felt more like getting up in the pulpit and shouting it out and then sitting down and letting the people see it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's power in that verse. There's enough power in that verse to break your heart and bring you to Jesus once it gets down in your heart that God loved you. Mr. Moody told the story of the young man from England that preached for five or six nights on For God So Loved the World. The same text, and he was so impressed by it, he said when he built the old Chicago Avenue church, he put on the gas jet right over the pulpit where it would blaze and burn night after night. God is love. Dr. Torrey said one night, he said, I was preaching one night, and a man went by, and the door was ajar, and he looked in and saw it, a drunken man, and he looked in and saw that burning out. He went down the street mumbling to himself and said, it ain't so. It ain't so. Nobody loves me. Dr. Torrey said he came back then and sat under the balcony, and when I had finished the sermon and dismissed the people, I went back and sat down by him and put my arm around him and led him to Jesus Christ. If it burns into your heart that God loves you, It'll transform your life. You know, there are three wrong attitudes that people have toward God. Three wrong attitudes that people have toward God. The first is the attitude of fear. I do not, how, I do not know how it ever happened. Maybe I didn't listen to my preacher right. I know by now that I did not read my Bible right. But somehow when I was a, when I was a child, I always thought more of Jesus than I did of God. Maybe it was because my mama told me when I was good that God loved me. And when I was bad that God didn't like me. Don't ever tell your child that. Because it was bad people for whom God loved. I heard a mother say, honey, you be a good little boy and you'll go to heaven. That's not true. You can be a good little boy and go to hell. You don't go to heaven because you're a good little boy. You don't go to heaven because you're a good little girl. You don't go to hell because you're a bad little boy or a bad little girl. You go to heaven or hell because of what you do with Jesus Christ. He is the one that you have to deal with. The attitude of fear. And so when I went to bed at night, oh, I love Jesus. I thought of the little children that climbed up on his lap and he put his arms around them. And then when I went to bed at night and I thought of God, I was afraid. And I pulled the cover up over my head. I thought he was a tyrant that sat up on a throne, was after me and would be happy when the day would come, when he could cut me down and put me in hell and watch me burn for all eternity. I was afraid. You say, Dr. Lakin, I thought the Bible said, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. I thought he said that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's true. And I thank God that he is, big, he is a big enough God to compel worship of men. And yet while he is that kind of a God, he is, so, he is a God that is so tender and so loving and merciful and kind as to say, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The little girl said, Oh, Lord Jesus, pour into my heart all of the grace that you have. Someone heard her say that and said, Honey, your little heart couldn't hold all the grace of God. She said it can't hold much, but it could run over an awful lot. To pour into her soul that. The poet said one drop of the blood of Jesus was seized to quench God's ire. Another said one drop of the blood of Jesus could wipe away the red anger spot from the brow of God. God never had any sea of ire. God never had any anger spot. A, per, a, a personal displeasure God a, might have had, but a personal animosity God had with no man. Personal animosity God has against no man. Governmental displeasure, yes. You said, that's why one said, why little boy said one day to his mama, Mama, what does God look like? What does God look like? Have you ever asked yourself, what does God look like? If you'd like to know, listen to this. He that has seen me has seen the Father. He that has seen me has seen God uncovered walking among you. Jesus said, put your fingers in my hands and feel the nail prints. Thrust them into my side. Listen, he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Do you want to know what God looks like? 
If you want to know about his power, oh, if you want to know about it, look at the stars and see his wisdom. Look at the flowers and see his glory. Look at the ocean and see his power. But when you look at Calvary, you will see his heart. I heard my mother pray. I heard my preacher preach. But the thing that broke my heart and brought me to Jesus was this. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and shame. He turned his languid eyes on me as beneath the cross I stood. Near shall I forget that book. If you want to know the heart of Jesus, if you want to know the heart of God, come to Calvary. Amen. The attitude of fear, second attitude that's wrong with the universe, that's wrong with man tonight, his attitude toward God is the attitude of the universalist. The attitude of the universalist that God died for, that Jesus died for everyone, hence everyone would be saved. Leading a person to Christ, and the man said, what does it say here? Said, for God so loved, who said the world? That it did what? Gave his only begotten Son. What for? That all the world might be saved. He said, don't lie on God. He didn't say that. Jesus died, my friend, that all might be saved. But he died that all could be saved. Never once, my friends, listen to me. No one is saved simply because Christ died. No one is saved simply because Christ died. There's plenty of bread in the bakery for your hunger. There's plenty of water in the reservoir for your thirst. But if you're going, if you're going to have the effects of it, you'll have to appropriate that to your need. And there is salvation for you, and there is salvation for everyone in this room tonight. But not simply because Christ died, but by faith you appropriate that by believing on him, and then it becomes a fix. Oh, Jesus died that all might be saved. I was speaking to a man not long ago, and I said, my friend, why don't you come tonight to Christ? He said, I don't know whether I'm elected or not. I said, have you ever been a candidate? <laughs> if you, if you, you'll never be a candidate, and you'll never get elected until you're a candidate. And when you become a candidate for salvation, God votes for you, the devil votes against you, that tied the election. Now it's up to you how you vote. Amen. Oh, listen to me, my friends. Don't you ever for one moment, whenever you become a, whenever you become a Calvinist, my friend, you are ruined. You are ruined as a soul winner. You are ruined as a soul winner. I do not believe that God ever created millions of little babies to just toss them into hell. And yet when you become an ultra-Calvinist, my friend, and reason it out to its logical conclusion, you have to believe in infant damnation. I've heard the old three-seaters and the old primitives say that there'll, be, that there'll be infants in hell not a finger length long. I do not believe that, as in Adam all died, so in Christ was all made alive. And all that they lost in Adam, they got in him. And now they're saved until they come to the place when they make their own decisions. And when you break and violate the first law of God, then you've failed and you've got to turn to Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you that he might redeem you, pay for all of your iniquities. The third man who stands without any hope, my friend, listen, is the indifferent. The man that is indifferent. I believe that's the one thing that hurts the heart of God worse than anything else, the attitude of indifference. That hurts the... Listen, I'd rather you'd come at me in physical combat as to, patch, as to pass me up day after day and ignore me, never speak to me. And some of you, my friend, tonight, I'll go about enjoying all the blessings of God, but like a common hog eating acorns under a tree, you never lift your head to grunt your thanks for one thing that he did for you. A hog never looks up till he's flat at his back. That's the only time some people will ever look up. Indifference. That's what's wrong with your church. That's what's wrong with this country and this community. What? The attitude of absolute indifference. Let me tell you this. 75% of the people of this city tonight live as though there was no God in the universe. As though there was no God in the universe. You pass him up day after day. Someone said to me, Dr. Lakin, what does a man have to do to go to hell? Nothing. Just sit right where you are. Hell hath enlarged itself and opened up his mouth without measure. And all the wicked shall be turned into hell with all the nations that forget or ignore God. 
Just leave God out of your thinking, that's all. Yonder as they took Jesus out of the city of Jerusalem, going around yonder to the hill of Calvary for the crucifixion, and as they passed out of the gate, the old spit and whittle club was sitting there. That's the crowd that used to sit around the barber shop and the grocery store and cuss and whittle and run the government. Let me tell you something. And as they passed out, one of them said, I believe there's going to be a crucifixion. And they got up and followed the crowd, and they were too lazy to go all the way up. And one of them said, here is a good place to watch it. And sitting down, they watched it there. Sitting down, they watched him there. Think of it sitting down, too lazy to go all the way up. They watched him, who? The Son of God and soon to be Savior of the world. They watched him. He who would, who would say in a little while, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They watched him. The Son of God dying upon a cross. They watched Him there, where? On a cross. In their place, in your place, and my place. They watched Him there. They watched Him there. Soon the rocks would leave their ancient cohesion. Soon the veil of the temple would be rent in twain. And soon, my friend, the sun would refuse to shine. And soon the grave would open. And the saints would arise. No wonder the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Why? Because the, 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 the Son of God was dying upon a cross. And no wonder it was rent in vain. Listen to me. No wonder the rocks left the ancient cohesion. Why? Because the rock of ages was being lifted. No wonder the sun refused to shine. Because the Son of Righteousness was dying upon a cross. No wonder the graves burst open. Why? Because he who was to conquer death, hell, and the grave was dying upon a cross. It's to me like instead of one poor fellow saying, Remember me when you come into your kingdom, that that whole bloodthirsty crowd would have broken down and cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now I come to another thing. You say, Dr. Lincoln, why did God ever love me? That's the big miracle to me. Why did God ever love me? And that's the thing I've had to, that's the thing I've tried to figure out. A person said to me one day, why did God ever choose Israel? He said, I wouldn't have, a, I wouldn't serve a God that had a chosen people. I said, I don't know why he did. I've been puzzled enough trying to find out why he chose me. That's the big puzzle to me. I think, first of all, he loved us because he created us. And he was interested in the thing that he made. And I believe he created us as he said it into the Garden of Eden. Amen. I believe Adam came fresh from the hand of God. A little two by squirt said to me not long ago. He said, how old was Adam? I said, old enough to have more sense than you got. Because he named all the animals. Can you? He said, you don't believe in evolution, do you? I said, I didn't. But now, I'm not too sure. I believe God created him as he said he did in the Garden of Eden. I believe God loved us because he created us. Then I think God loved us because of our need. Why, did you ever go into a home where there was an afflicted or an, a one? Did you ever notice that? My friend, that's the one that always gets the most affection. If you want to know how much somebody loves you, wait until they have an opportunity to express that love. And then you'll know, amen. Somebody said to me, Dr. Lincoln, wasn't it a terrible thing that Adam sinned? I said, I don't think so. I don't think it was too bad. Why? Because if Adam had never sinned, I never would have known how much God loved me. Because I never would have had an opportunity. He never would have had an opportunity of expressing his love. If Adam had not sinned, it was Adam's sin that gave God the opportunity of expressing the love that was in his heart. There. Why did God love me? I think God loved me because of what I am. Somebody said, do you believe man has a soul? I said, no, I do not. Neither do you. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. God breathed into man's nostril the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Soul, what is it? It's a hope that is higher than the throne of God. In this age it shall pass by, and the soul shall watch the procession. Stars shall be wrung out of their sockets, and the earth shall be burned to a cinder, and the soul shall watch the, shall watch the conflagration. 
So what is it? It's a hope that is higher than the throne of God. No line can measure it. Nothing can erase it. So created in the image of God. In what image? In the image of the eternity of God created he man. And from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. And my friend, until you find the grave of God, man will live on. There was a time when I was not. There will never come a time when I will not be again. You look at me tonight, but you don't see me. You see the house I live in. You see the, you, you see the house I live in. You see the vehicle through which I express my emotions. My joys and my sorrows, but the real me, the real I, you do not under, you do not see. You do not see. Take me out of this tonight, and this won't get hungry. Take me out of this, and this won't get thirsty. Take me out of this, and it won't have joy or sorrow. It's the me that's in it, my friend. God love me because of what I am. I am a soul. A soul that'll live on and on and on. Shine on, little moon, that when you've been blown out, I'll still live. Burn on, Mr. Sun, but when you've been burned to ashes, I'll live on. Shine on, little stars, but when you've been pulled from your socket to the sky, I'll still live on. I'll still live on. Amen. Time will never come when I will cease to be. Amen. My daddy slipped off to heaven one day. The little, and the, the, the undertaker prepared his body. I went in and stood beside his coffin, and I put my hand upon his head, and I said, Dad, you're not dead. You've just moved out for repairs, that's all. I remember that night when I preached here, and I staggered off the platform, and they got me, and Jerry the next morning came and took me to the hospital, and the doctor said he must go quickly to the hospital. They didn't know what was the matter and haven't yet found that. They took me to the hospital on the night, night, that night. Jerry and another brother came up the back way. The hospital was closed, but they came up the way they took out the dead. And when they came up, and I came in, and Jerry said he never saw a man shouting his way into heaven. And I said, Jerry, you think the last, that was the last one I'd ever preached last night? Jerry said, well, I hope not. I said, well, she is a good in one. <laughs> Let me tell you. Thursday, Thursday night we closed, Jerry, Friday night. Friday morning, Ronnie and his wife came up to see me. They, stay, they came over and kissed me and then told me goodbye. And I said, you go on back to Florida now, son. And if I don't make it, if I don't make it, Jerry will have this old house fixed up. I won't be in it. But he'll have this old house fixed up and bring it back down to Fort Gay. And you bring Mommy Bob up there. And then go up there in the cemetery and have the, my old neighbors to dig a grave down beside your daddy where the Lord went 2,000 years ago and cleaned it out and made it a good place for me to wait for the resurrection. Amen. I won't be there. I won't be there. Let me tell you something tonight, my friend. If I cease to breathe upon this platform tonight, the next minute I walk the streets with God and the angels. He said, what about the unconscious? There'll never be a moment of unconsciousness. Amen. Amen. There'll never be a moment of unconsciousness. To be absent is to be present with the Lord. To be present with the Lord. And then I think he loved me because of not only what I am, but what I am capable of becoming through grace. I know God loved me when I was a 17-year-old boy plowing a mule around the rocky hillside. I know that God loved me then. I think he looked beyond that, my friend, and saw me preaching the gospel up and down and back and forth across this continent, across one ocean twenty times and then the other two, preaching the gospel and then here tonight preaching, my friends, to across the nation and around the world to crowds like this tonight. God saw that. That was more than I could ever imagine or even dream about. Amen. I thank God for men like this that's given me an opportunity. I don't know. Young preacher said to me not long ago, what did you ever do to promote yourself from a mule and saddlebags to the largest tabernacle in the world and all of this? I said, not one thing. I never ask a man for a meeting. I never sent out a brochure. I never ask a man how much you're going to give me. The fact of the matter is I never expected to be anything more than a country preacher. And that's what I am tonight. I don't know exactly which country, but I'm, I'm a country preacher. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. You don't mind if I shout a little while, do you? Did you know what? He said that he loved dirty sinners. He said he loved us and washed us. He didn't wash us and then love us. He loved us when we were unlovely. Anybody can love lovely people, but it takes divine love to love unlovely people. 
When Mrs. Lincoln loved me, she loved me at my best. When I went to see her, I put on my best clothes and my best manners, and that's the reason she's a little disappointed in me now. But let me tell you something. When God loved me, He loved me when there was nothing about me to be loved. He said He loved me and washed me. Now I want to talk about the extent of His love for a moment. He said, For God so loved the world. No, just a few people on the right side of the tracks. Oh, God loved the world. God so loved the world. Not just a few of the highbrows. Highbrows are fellows that's educated above his intelligence. He said, he'll love. Oh, just a few of the upper crust. A few crumbs held together by dough. Let me tell you something today. Oh, for God so loved the world. And I've been asking God to give me a love for every soul for whom Jesus died. God so loved the world. Isn't that something? And that's the thing I like about this man. He has a world vision. The poor and the hungry and the needy spend a million dollars to feed this group and that group and the other group. Doesn't matter how much they talk. Let them talk. Amen. But let me tell you, God's looking on and saying, I'm proud of it, son. I'm proud of it, son. Oh, I've often tried to imagine whom God loved. And I, I can't quite think, I can't quite grasp the thing. So I'd like to say tonight, angel of God, step over the embattlements of heaven, will you please, and come down the golden stairway and stand here up by me on this platform and tell these people whom God loved. He said, okay, let's go down yonder and climb the marble steps of the, of the, of the millionaire's home and tell him that God loves him. Then we'll go down in the hovel and the hut and tell the harlot, the drunkard, and the scarlet woman, and the impure to tell him that God loved them. And then we'll go out across the field to the farmer's door to tell him that God loved him, and to every village, hamlet, and town to tell them that God loved them. And then out across the rippling waters of the mighty sea to the Indies Coral Mountain and down Indies Coral Strand to tell him that God loved them. And then out to the isles of the Pacific where the dark-skinned mother nurses her babe to sleep by the lapping of the waves to tell her that God loved her. And then if God had forgotten, he'd dip his pen in the ink of fire and write in blazing letters across the sky, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. That means that he would not perish, that he would never, never, never again come into condemnation. God so loved that he gave his only begotten Son. Mrs. Lincoln and I walked out of the, our house, uh, our home up yonder one morning in West Virginia while the dew was still on the grass and walked up there and stood under that big old tree where a little mound contains the body of all that we ever had. And as I stood there and put my arm around her, I said, Honey, I know what God meant now when he said he gave his only begotten son. He gave the only son he had. What for? That whosoever believeth in him. Well, you said, I don't know where I'm elected. He didn't say that. He didn't say whosoever's elected. He said, whosoever will. Amen. I wouldn't know. I might not know my own name in it, but when he said whosoever, I know I'm whomsoever. Amen. Therefore, tonight, he breaks the power of canceled sin. And out of love to him tonight, I say, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art man. The all the follies of sin I resign, my precious Redeemer. My Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis thou. Thank God. If I had to meet God in 30 minutes, that's the best I could do for you. Lord, I gave him the best I had tonight. 